Hi, it's time for a chime video. Today we have something interesting and rather unique. This was all sent in by James from New York. And this is a new old stock model L35. And you can almost make it out on the box here where I think it said L35. Or perhaps it's actually a K35 because in here, in the wall housing, which you may or may not be able to see, it actually says K35 and then it says June 1956. So that's right on the verge of when it might have been changed over to an L35, which would be what it may be said on the box, because 55, 56, 57 is when K model chimes started to become L model chimes. This might have been made in June of 56, but it might not have been boxed up until later and they held off because they were waiting for the new boxes or who knows what. This is all a new old stock chime. I'm not sure where he got it from, but he bought it recently. Like anything this old, it needs a little bit of attention. When he got it, he found that it didn't necessarily work correctly the tips and the plungers for the door chime had fallen out and it's got some other issues and we have the clock over here this is a very popular chime this is a very much a mid-century modern sort of atomic style clock that they used to make this is going to be a two-part series the first part today we're going to deal with the chime and part two we're going to look at the clock what's our task here well our task is to reassemble the chime these are all the parts, so it rings properly again. And it's got a little bit of a problem. This K, or L35 door chime, has a fairly typical new tone two note power assembly. This is a variation on a standard one because this is a model with a clock. So you have extra terminals where the clock plugs into it for power. And then you have front door connection for two notes, rear door connection for one note. He said that when he bought this, the tips in the plungers, the glue had dried out and the tips had fallen out. So he re-glued them in what he believes is the correct distance off the end of the plunger based on where the dried glue was originally. So that's probably a good guess. These are the brass caps that hold it all together. They go on the ends of the solenoid tubes here and here. But the big problem here is the spring. The spring is rather mangled and I'm going to make a wild guess here is that this is not the original spring that came with this chime. If it is, someone stretched it out quite a bit and then it was too long so they cut the end of it off. There is also supposed to be a second spring. There's two springs in this type of power assembly and the short small spring is missing. So my job today is to sort of clean all this up, although it's in really good shape to start with, and deal with the mangled spring and the missing springs and I'm going to show you how you do this. Fortunately, we have replacement springs. These are springs that I had made years ago. These springs were specifically made to put into new tone K model door chimes, long tube eight note door chimes, and they are exact and direct replacements for original new tone eight note K model chime springs. They are a good general purpose spring for many different chimes if you know how to deal with them. And that's what I'm going to show. So to fix Mike's power assembly, which originally had two springs, we're going to need three springs to start with. I'm going to show you sort of the anatomy of a spring and then what you have to do to put it together to make it work properly. So let's talk about springs. This is Mike's original spring. And I hope you can see it's kind of bent and twisted and you can see the coils are uneven and this end obviously has been cut off. And as this is right now, it's not gonna work in a door chime whatsoever. So for right now, we're gonna put that aside. And let's talk about these springs. So these are our newly made replacement eight note long tube K model chime springs. These springs are not the right size for Mike's power unit, but we have a way to adjust them so they will work. So let's talk about the anatomy of a spring. 
Springs are complicated. There are probably a bazillion springs that have been made in the world. Each one was designed and engineered for its specific task. Just to jump ahead for a second, no, you can't go down to the hardware store and find a spring like this because they're not going to have it. They're going to have lots of general purpose-y kind of springs, but they're not going to have door chime springs. So it's got to be the right type. The important parts of springs are, of course, the diameter of the coils because it has to fit inside the solenoid tube properly. If it's too big, of course, it won't go in. And if it's too small, it won't seat in against the plunger and the end cap properly, and that's not gonna work. You have the number of coils per inch. You have to have the right amount of coils, the right number of coils. They have to be spaced out correctly. You have the type of materials it's made out of, and you also have the diameter of the wire that's used to make the coils. And for today's purpose, the most important part have to do with the ends of the springs. So the ends of the spring is here and here, and most all springs, these are what would be called compression springs, on the ends they have what are called the dead coils. The dead coils are the flattened coils at the beginning and the end of the spring, based on which way you have it sitting around. And they don't add tension to the spring because the coils are collapsed, but they provide, in this case, a seat for the springs. So when a spring like this sits in its end cap, which goes on the end of the solenoid, it sits, the dead coil sits down against the inside of the cap, like that, and it keeps it in place. If you didn't have dead coils, if you took Mike's original spring, which at this end actually has dead coils, but at this end it's been cut off, so it's kind of jaggedy. See how it's cut off? If you put this in here like this, over time, as you operate this, the chime, this spring may rotate inside the solenoid bore, and eventually the cutoff end of the spring is going to find its way through the opening in the end cap and very slowly wind itself out, which I don't know if you can see that very well or not, but it's sort of sticking out. So you can't have that. You have to have dead coils that help seat the spring in its device so it stays where it's supposed to stay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to alter these springs to make them the correct length for Mike's chime. I'm going to put one of those pop-up tag things that's going to pop up right here somewhere that's going to take you to another video about a new tone two note long tube door chime power assembly and in that video starting around the nine minute mark or so there's a drawing of a plunger assembly like this one not exactly the same but it's very close and it shows the tip length but it also shows the length of the springs so you can refer to that if you are going to try to do something like this yourself. We need two springs. The right hand spring is the long spring and it's supposed to be 29 and a half millimeters long. And the left hand spring is a short one and it's supposed to be approximately 13 millimeters long. Now these springs measure, and I'm going to put two of these aside. Now, I have also, in all of my chime videos, as far as I know, lecture everyone about springs and the care and feeding of springs. Springs are, by far, for door chimes, the most lost item on the planet. If you don't handle your springs well and they take a bounce off the workbench and they end up on the floor, you'll never find it again. They disappear. I believe that when they hit the floor, their molecules of the metal that make up the spring dissolve instantly and it's gone forever. So you have to have some kind of container to put your springs in. And of course here, we like the little metal cup idea. So you need to have something to put your springs in. You would be completely and totally shocked 
about how many people call me and they say something like, I was servicing my chime and I was following what your video said to do exactly and I lost three of the four of the springs. And it's like, well, how did you do that? Well, I had them on the table and then somebody called and I had to go make a bologna sandwich and then I had to run and pick the kids up from school and they needed ice cream and then I came back and they were gone. It's like, dude, put them in a container. It's not that hard. Find something to put them in. Put them in a little empty pickle jar. Do something, but just don't leave them on the table because you're going to lose them. All right. So here's our spring, which we know is too long. So let's do a quick measurement on the spring here and see about what size it is. So this spring is approximately 37 and three quarter millimeters long. 37.76 give or take. These are not NASA quality springs. They're not going to Mars or they're not going to the helicopter on Mars to make something work. They're going in the doorbell. So a tenth of a millimeter or so isn't going to make any difference. So these are 37 and three quarters millimeters long and they need to be 29 and a quarter millimeters long. So we're going to take our calipers and we're going to shrink them down here a little bit and get really close to 29 and a quarter. See how good we can do here. Uh, close enough, 29.26, I think that will do it. And what we have to do is we have to mark the spring for its length. Now, I like to use a red Sharpie. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this by eye. I'm gonna line up the caliper at one end, which is the dead end. And then I'm gonna look very carefully and mark the other end with the Sharpie. This Sharpie is kind of dried out. All right, so once you mark it, then you have to cut it. So I'm just using a little pair of wire cutters here, and I'm gonna very carefully find my red mark and snip it. Now we have two pieces. We have one piece that's 29 and three and a quarter, and we have a little scrap piece. So we'll get rid of the scrap piece for right now because we don't need that. And now we have a spring that's 29 and a quarter millimeters long. And you might think, well, that's super because it's ready to go, but it's not because like Mike's original spring, we now have a spring that's been cut. So one end of the spring has dead coils on it, but the other end of the spring has this little cut off piece here with no dead coils. And that's not gonna work because it's gonna wind itself around something. And then over time, it's not gonna work correctly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this one that we just cut and we're gonna put it where? In our cup. And now we're gonna take the second one after we untwist it because springs have this other tendency to want to coil themselves together, which is actually for today's video an advantage. So if we can get them apart like that, put that one in there. And here's our second spring, which is still full length. So guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna cut this one also. So again, using my calipers, I'm going to mark it with the Sharpie, we'll put the calipers aside, and we're going to cut this one. Right on the right mark. Now again, we have two pieces. This little short piece, that's scrap. That goes in the scrap cup and we're going to get out our first one that we cut and we're going to put these side by side. So here now we have two springs that are 29 and a quarter millimeters long. They've each been cut off. They each have dead coils on one end and they have cut coils on the other end. So they, you probably think, well, that's great. Now what are you going to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of the natural nature of springs and we're going to put them together. 
And when we put them together, we're gonna to put them together so that, see, they wanna go everywhere. All right. So we have dead coils on this one on the left and on this one we have dead coils on the right. And what we're gonna do is, that's the orientation that we're gonna slip them together like this. Voila. Now we have one spring, because they're woven together, with dead coils on this end and dead coils on that end, and the cut ends are woven into the dead coils to some degree. Now we have a spring that's the right length with dead coils on both ends, and that can be used in Mike's power assembly. But there's one more thing you have to do. If you put it in the chime solenoid tube just as it is now, you still have to worry about them possibly unwinding each other inside the chime because one of the ways you have to look at something like this is once you put this all back together and we test it here at the shop, you know, we're going to ring it six, eight, ten times and then it's going to work fine. And then we're going to send it back to Mike and he's going to install it in his house. And over the next, you know, 30 years that he might live there, you know, door chimes last 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It's got to work right all those times. Maybe if it only works right for 35 years and then it needs to be serviced, eh, then Mike's probably okay with that. But, you know, if two years after he puts it up, it starts to have a problem, that's not so good. He's going to be on the phone. So we need to do something to make sure that the springs stay together without compromising how the springs will operate. And to do that, we're going to use this. This is super glue and this is ultra gel control super glue super glue comes in a vast variety of consistencies and styles and colors you'd be surprised the world of super glue is vast and complicated like most things are this is loctite and this is a type that you can buy at your local home center and you know those big box places with the big orange signs. I prefer this kind as compared to regular super glue, which is running like water, because this will stay where you squeeze it. And this is what we use. We use this a lot here on lots of different kinds of things and it works really well. Please don't glue your fingers together. So what we're gonna do is, we already have interwoven these together. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna very carefully put a couple little dabs of the gel super glue on the ends of the dead coils. There and there. And there. And there, and that's all there is to it. Now, the ends of the springs have been glued together. The most important thing at this point now is patience, because you have to let the super glue dry. I'm gonna let this dry for at least overnight, because you don't want to get super glue on your finger, you don't want to get super glue inside the solenoid bore, and really, what's the big rush? So right now, we'll just pick this up carefully like this, and see it already started sticking to the paper a little bit and we're going to put it inside our tin cup and just let it sit there this is spring number three which you saw in the beginning why do we need spring number three we need spring number three because we need another spring the short spring for the left hand side of the solenoid bore and basically we're going to do exactly the same thing now spring number three is going to be 13 millimeters so let's reset this to zero and we'll slide this to 13. Try not to overshoot here. Let's see if we can get really close to 13 that. It's always harder to do than you think. That's close enough, 13.06. Now, the nice thing about this is, the reason you only need three springs is, you can cut one end off and the other end off and the middle section will be the scrap. So, we're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna mark it and we're going to cut it. Put 
put it aside and then we're going to mark the other end like that and we're going to cut it and we're going to throw the middle piece away because I don't need it and again now we have two springs two short springs dead ends dead coils on the left cut coil on the right dead coils on the right cut coil on the left and we're going to do exactly the same thing which is we're going to weave them together like this the shorter ones are usually a little trickier to hold on to and you also have to be careful that you don't mash them up with your fingers but you want to try to get them it woven together as straight as possible. It's just always trickier to do when it's smaller. And if you don't get it quite right, they'll be all crooked. And then it's not going to fit in the solenoid bore very well. And when you go to put it all back together, it won't really want to fit. So this is one of those kind of fussy things that you have to do if you're going to fix doorbells. Let's try it again. See, sometimes what happens is the coils wind around each other and if they do that it's difficult to get it to slide in in the right spot because it sort of screwed itself together which is not really exactly what you're looking for nope now it's too far off or eh, maybe not no, see now it sort of wound itself in place. We can get this one. See it's the cut end and this end that's a little bit being tricky. If we can get it down below just a tad. This is when the really good tweezers come into play. And that will do it. So, once we have that meshed together correctly, a little dab of super glue, and another one over here. I usually do two on both sides, or on each end, I should say. That seems to be enough and to work properly. And then I'll set that down there. Now, if you do get super glue on your fingers, the, the thing you have to worry about is you don't want to glue your fingers together like this because then you all know what happens. Uh, and it does come apart with acetone if you have some. So what you do is, if you do get super glue on your finger like this, instead of like rubbing it off with your other finger and then getting them glued together, grab a rag and wipe it off on the rag and you'll be fine. Okay, so this one is done. See, it wants to stick to the paper. Part of the cut coil on this end is sticking up a little high. So what we'll do is, I'm gonna do it now so you can see, even though typically I would do it after it dries, is you just snip it off. It was only a little bit and it's not gonna make much difference. So there's our doubled up short spring and here's our doubled up long spring. One of the things about this, we've doubled it up so we have the dead coils on each end. One of the other factors in springs is 
the the size of the spring is not just the decompressed length it's also the compressed length so the thicker the metal that makes up the coils is the thicker the spring will be when it's fully compressed doing it this way adds a little bit to the total length of the compressed spring, but not enough in a door chime that it's gonna make a difference. The other thing that it also does is you're doubling up the tension of the spring because originally it was one spring with one set of coils, so it compresses and then when the solenoid turns off, it springs the plunger back. Now you have double the spring, so you're gonna have more force when it pushes the plunger back, but that's not usually much of a problem because again, it's in a door chime. It's while there is a certain amount of precision to the way they designed it, it certainly can't accommodate this. So it's not a problem. They generally tends to work out pretty well. So I'll be back after all this dries. Hi, it's the next day. Our springs, which we meshed together yesterday and then put a little uh, super glue on to hold them in place, are now dry and they're in good condition. They worked out really well. They're very springy, like that. And now it's time to put our power unit assembly back together. So here's all of our parts. We have the solenoid assembly here. We have the two brass end caps. We have our two springs that we made up and we have our plunger assembly. Now, for those of you who are really paying attention, you'll notice that the plunger assembly today has white tips on it, and yesterday it had red tips. And actually, I don't know, I didn't really save the red tips. But anyway, what I discovered in trying some things out this morning before I started recording this is Mike, the owner of this chime, one of the things he told me was, when he bought it, the red tips had fallen out of the ends of the plungers and he had glued them back in where he thought they should be. Unfortunately, he didn't really get it quite right. There is a certain amount of length of tip that has to be at each end. Otherwise, when the chime rings, if they're too short, they don't hit the tone bars correctly. And also, if they're too long, they don't hit the tone bars correctly. They have to be just right. It's a lot like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. He, I don't know what he glued them in with, but they wouldn't come out. They were stuck. So the only solution, and they one, one side was fine, the other side was way too short. Enough so that it wouldn't actually hit the tone bar. Maybe it would hit it once out of every 25 times and then it would barely glance it and it obviously wasn't correct. The only solution was to make new tips and that's what I did. So I took out the old tips, I actually cut them off and I drilled out the plastic, the red plastic that was inside the ends of the plungers or plunger and then made new tips like we do on a lot of these chimes. All these chimes come to us and these power unit assemblies in particular, the tips are missing altogether. Together. So I glued in new tips. I did that early this morning and they've had enough time to dry and then I cut them, trimmed them to length and shaped the tips and did all of that and now we're ready for reassembly. So sometimes things work out that way and sometimes they don't. What are you going to do? So let's take a look at what it takes to put this back together and uh, we'll get this chime finished up. One of the things about any new tone chime that uses brass caps on the ends of the solenoid tubes are over time, the brass caps often split. And this is gonna be kinda of hard to see, but I'll try to show you on this one if I can. So if you look really carefully, right here, there's a split in the brass, right there. And that's from the pressure against the brass cap when it's pushed onto the solenoid tube because it's just sort of a friction fit. And it's enough of a stress after 50, 60 years that the brass cracks and that can be a problem. Why is it a problem? It's a problem because when the chime operates and the solenoids move back and forth, left and right, basically they're hammering away at the inside flange of the cap. And if the cap isn't held on securely, eventually it's gonna get knocked off. And then that's when there's nothing to stop the plunger from 
exceeding its travel to some degree and that's when springs fall out and get lost and all of those kind of things happen. So we have to do something to correct that because we can't have caps flying off. So again, we're going to go back to our all-purpose super glue and we're going to very lightly glue the caps back on. When we do this, we're going to do it very lightly and carefully because we don't want to glue them on so much that you never, ever, ever can get them off again. You only want to glue them on just a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a little bit of super glue on the end of the solenoid tube in two spots. And when I say a little bit, I mean like a little bit, like that much and that much. And I don't know how easy or hard that is to see, but there's just the littlest dabs in two spots. And then we'll take the brass cap and we'll push it on. And usually I turn it just a little and that helps smear out the super glue so it spreads around slightly. Now, super glue will soften up if it's heated a little bit. And yes, I've had times that I had to take this apart again. And typically what I'll do is I'll just sit this down and pretend that the screwdriver is my soldering iron and I will just lay the soldering iron on it like that and wait a little while and that will warm up the brass, it'll soften up the super glue and then you can use a screwdriver to pop the cap off. Hopefully we won't have to do that. Once we've done that, now it's easy. We're gonna take our short spring goes in first, short spring goes on the left. So we'll put that in. and then our plunger goes in, and then our long spring goes in, and our other cap goes on. Now this cap I'm not gonna glue yet because we are gonna try this to make sure it works and sounds correctly before we glue it because it's a simple thing just to pop it off again, put a little dab of super glue, and then put it back together. One of the things I like about this L35, or possibly K35, is that it has a slide-on bracket inside the case that the power unit assembly fits on. Now, the power unit in this case sits at the bottom of the chime, and we know that because the bracket is down here at one end, and also because the label has writing on it in this orientation. I do not believe that the label and the ink stamp would have been put on upside down. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm pretty sure this is the way it goes. And of course, when you put your power unit back in, the writing would be right side up so you can read it because that's how you build things. What, the, what happens here is the inner parts of the cage of the power unit assembly is going to slide down over this bracket right here and basically it just slips in place like that which is kind of nice most of the time in most of these chimes that use a power unit assembly like that on the back of the chime there'll be little dimpled recesses and there'll be two screws that hold it in place and i imagine that having to wiggle it around and get it lined up and put the two screws in and do all of that, plus you have to buy the screws and everything, is a lot more expensive than just having a bracket welded inside the chime housing. The other thing about this chime housing, which I kind of like is, of course, the box is metal, but also the resonators, which are this and this, it's what echoes the sound and makes it louder. Think about like when you play a guitar, that's the reason why you have a big opening in the front of the guitar underneath the strings because that makes it louder. These are metal also and so it has a lot of strength in the way it's all put together because it's all steel and also I think it gives it a good sound. So I'm going to go ahead and wire this up and then uh, we'll ring it and see if we did good. All right I've got it wired up. It's just on a standard doorbell button. Happens to be a new tone button. What are the odds? And I've got it wired up on the front door, and when we ring it, we should get two notes. And it resonates very nicely. It's really that long.
until it stops resonating. It's actually very nice. And I think one of the reasons why it resonates so long is because it has the metal resonators instead of plastic. I think the plastic resonator boxes that they used on chimes later on, I think it deadens the sound a little bit. This is much brighter sounding. And if we move this connection to the rear, because this is a two door chime. You have front door and rear door. And front door is two notes, rear door is a single note. Just like that. You might notice, let's see if I can show you this. This is one of those things that people always ask me. Here on the left hand side, right here, you can see the tip of the plunger sticking out past the end of the brass cap just a little bit. That's the way it's supposed to be. How does this actually operate? Because this is the other thing that people don't seem to understand about how a chime like this operates. So if you think about, let me put it back on front for a second. If you think about what we had when we reassembled it, inside the solenoid, there's a short, the short spring is here on the left, and then the plunger goes across, and the long spring is on the right. In its ready to go position, like right now it's ready to ring. So it's waiting for somebody to come and push that button and say the pizza's here. The solenoid, the, the long spring on the right hand side is is not compressed. It's extended out to its full length and it's pushing the plunger fully to the left as far as the spring can push it. That's why this tip sticks out just a little bit. To make this work properly, the plunger has to be back to the left. So when you energize the coil by someone pushing the button and it creates its electromagnetic force, it like gives the plunger some momentum to rock it to the right and hit the first tone bar. If the plunger was sitting all the way here already, if it was sticking out a little bit like this one is, if it was sticking out on the right just a little bit and the travel of it was only going to be a half an inch, it wouldn't have any force. It needs the run up. It needs the space to move to the right to gain enough force to hit the tone bar with any amount of strength. As soon as the visitor, the pizza guy, lets go of the button, the solenoid turns off. Now, the, the plunger has moved to the right, and when it's moved to the right, it has compressed our spring that we made. So all of the energy that it took to compress the spring is inside the spring. And when the pizza guy lets go of the button, all that energy in, that's built up in the spring as the solenoid turns off will push the plunger back to the left. And as it pushes it back, because it's a long spring and it has a lot of energy in it, as it pushes it back, it's gonna pop out at this end and cause this tip to hit the left-hand tone bar. The little spring on the left-hand end, remember that's the short spring over here, that's been compressed also because once this tip has hit the left-hand tone bar, that spring and, and the energy is gone, that spring's gonna push the plunger back into the solenoid to the right just a little bit. So again, it's at its at ready position. So when we push it, it's gonna to go to the right and the, and the spring is fully compressed. And when we let go and it shuts off, the energy in the spring shoots it back to the left and causes it to hit the other tone bar. And that's how this works. It's not complicated and it's not energized in both direction. It's not like when you push the button, one half energizes and makes it go this way and then somehow magically the other half energizes and pulls it back. It doesn't work that way. It's all about the springs. If you take the springs out, it doesn't work. You need the springs in there to make it work correctly. Now, if we move it over to rear, which is a single note, the single note being just this hand, this side, this is a dual coil solenoid. There's one big coil here and there's a shorter, smaller coil on the left. When you connect to the rear terminal and you push the button, you're only energizing this side, the left-hand coil, and it makes it pop out on the left, makes a single note, and then as soon as you let go of the button and this small coil turns off, the spring, which has been compressed, 
will make the plunger go back to the right just a little bit so it's ready to go again. And that's basically how it works. It's very, very simple, but it's also very, very specific in how it works and how it has to go back together. And all the pieces have to be the right size and the right length. The problem <clears throat> with the plunger that Mike glued together was the tip on this side was too short and when it would pop out, it wouldn't really hit the tone bar. Every once in a while, it would kind of glance it just a little bit, but not really enough, and it didn't sound right. In the end, whenever you fix any door chime, no matter what kind it is, in the end, it's all about what does it sound like? Because if it doesn't sound proper, it doesn't matter how well it works. That's really all about the sound. And Newtone cared about the sound. So that's the ins and outs of sort of renovating or restoring a 1950s, early 1960s, either L35 or K35. It says K35 in here, but the box kind of looked like an L model box, but the label's torn, so it's really hard to tell. So that's really the ins and outs of what that's all about. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps for someone it will be helpful if it is, give it a thumbs up on YouTube because that helps us just a little bit. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell, and when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.